More than struggling, anticipating the casket. Reap what we sow, trying to fill up my basket. Life's a plantation, I self law and master. Over the plot, I've been granted on this planet. Now we're slanted, cause the chosen been supplanted. But if you overstand it, it was spoken. Fracture, but we ain't broken. Even though some would rather play the role of token, we growing. Black through the essence of a presence. We carry the blood of gods, we carry the mind of peasants. Rich black gardens. Future look more like Eden Multiply seeds like the seed banks in Sweden Rep my planners on plan according to season Be one cold, switching it up is treason Black power, family what we eat Either we get fed or we feed Be one bad. Copyright disclaimer under section 107 of the Copyright Act of 1976. Allowances made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. Nonprofit, educational, or personal use tips to balance in favor of fair use. Welcome, Black. Welcome, Black. Welcome, Black B1 Ag family. Welcome to B1AG, the Daily Bread Podcast. I'm John Henry Harris, and we also have Farmer Brown, the MC. Here at B1AG, we focus on Black agriculture as it pertains to agriculture production, education, marketing, health, food, nutrition, and economics, all for the Black family and the Black community. Welcome. It's Monday, start of a new week, new week, new reach. I hope we, uh, Continue to stay in a growth mind state and expand your reach, whatever in whatever field you're in, uh, expand your reach in uh, abundance, prosperity, most of all in love. Today, we have a great story for you. That we're going to talk about. Well, I wouldn't say a great story, uh, but we would we do like to hear be one. We do like to keep you abreast of what's going on with our black farmers and the continuals the continuous uh it seems like just a lot of obstacles that are being placed in their way and uh we definitely would uh would like to get the word out about the plight of our black farmers because at the end of the day it affects how we eat and 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 if it affects how we eat it affects how we grow uh today's story is called kick the can uh, Florida judge blocks the black farmers debt relief. Farmer Brown, it's a serious uh, talk today, uh, but let's get through it, bro. What do you have to say? First, I'd just like to say peace to the B1 family. Hope everybody's doing well uh, in a growth state of mind. So here at B1 Ag, we want to be real codified. We don't want to lend anything to our opinion. Uh, we don't want to lend, lend anything to conjecture. And so when we talk about the USDA, uh, that's the United States Department of Agriculture. And from their mouths, from their mouths, their mission statement is maintain a strong, appropriate safety net for American farmers, ranchers, and growers. This includes assistance to struggling industries. We can think of a lot of struggling industries. Disaster assistance, this will be your weather. Uh, crop insurance, okay, so you know if you've gotten sold some bad seeds or your operation didn't work as well, provide technical assistance, access to credit, and help producers implement com com conservation practices. Uh, that sounds utopian. It sounds you, you know like a great service per your taxpayer dollar. Uh, when we have these conversations, I want the B1 family to understand that with all of these altruistic, wonderful purposes for the United States Department of Agriculture, a lot of the times what we call black farmers uh, melanated farmers aren't reaping the benefits of your tax dollar. Uh, one of the reasons we continuously have this conversation, it seems redundant, but until there are some action items that actually support these melanated farmers, uh, we, we got to keep the record spinning because they're getting denied. Uh, this story that we're going to talk about today, it's, uh, it's not a new story, but once again, this is updating from what happened earlier with the uh, debt relief bill. And so I look forward to digging into this conversation and really trying to figure out as uh, concerned members, 
of the community, as conscientious observers, as members of the agricultural community? What are some codified approaches to addressing this if we see that the tax funded agency who is tasked with addressing this is kicking the can down the road? Okay, B1 Ag family, just to give you a little update and just give you a little contextual information about what we're talking about, I'd like to show you a news report uh, from CBS uh, that actually talks about the Florida judge, which was the second judge to block this congressional uh, congressional law uh, ruling, you know, to give these black farmers this $4 billion in relief. You know, the Congress passed it, but it's getting tied up in the muck as far as with the courts. So uh, check this out, family, and then uh, just give you some information, background information about what's going on. Multiple legal challenges have halted a debt relief program intended to correct a history of racial discrimination against black farmers. The Emergency Relief for Farmers of Color Act was passed by Congress this spring as part of the American Rescue Plan. It would provide $4 billion in loan forgiveness from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. The act also lays out an additional billion dollars for grants and college scholarships for farmers of color. However, U.S. District Judge Marsha Morales Howard sided with a white farmer from Florida who sued to stop the program. She acknowledged the history of discriminatory behavior against black farmers, but wrote, Congress must also heed its obligations to do away with governmentally imposed discrimination based on race. That injunction is one of several seeking to prevent these funds from getting into the hands of black farmers. I want to bring in John Boyd Jr. now. He is the founder and president of the National Black Farmers Association and joins me from Boynton, Virginia. John, welcome. Great to have you with us again here on CBSN. Now, you have said that you will fight this decision all the way to the Supreme Court. Tell us why you believe this money from Congress is legally justifiable and what do you say to those who are challenging the law? Well, basically, uh, this is a real setback for black farmers, right, at, and farmers of color at, at planting season. And a few things I would like to clear up. This is not uh, farm uh, money for black farmers and farmers of color. This is debt relief uh, at USDA. You have to have a guaranteed loan or a direct loan. And what white farmers are doing in this country is suing uh, black farmers a, is a continuation of what we've been enduring this, in this country for many, many decades, uh, a continuation of Jim, Jim Crow and, and sharecropping and all of these things where it looks to me as uh, white farmers want all of the money and all of the resources instead of uh, sharing with other other ethnic groups, in, in this case, uh, black farmers. And it looks as though every time we try to get some redress from USDA, we're having to wait. Uh, so I've reached out to uh, President uh, uh, Biden to discuss this and to see what the administration may be able to do. Uh, these uh, white farmers are filing these lawsuits and very, very conservative courts around the country, Florida and Wisconsin and Texas, where we don't think we're going to get a fair share in those very, very conservative uh, uh, courts in this country. But we're going to continue to press on. But people need to know that uh, the National Black Farmers Association needs your support right now. Uh, it costs uh, money to fight and these cases and all, and, all, and, and all around the country. And so far, we've been meeting all of these deadlines and uh, raising the issue of historic uh, and continued di discrimination at the United States Department of Agriculture. And one thing these judges haven't done is really acknowledge the discrimination that we still face today as black farmers and farmers of color. So this isn't discrimination that happened 10 and 20 years ago. It did, but the discrimination also continues today and the courts are not looking at those very, very important issues as well. And you say you just recently reached out to the Biden administration. Did you receive a response? Well, I'm supposed to go to the White House on the 4th of July, but not to talk about this. And I'm hopeful that the administration, uh, in this case, uh, President President uh, Biden, will hear my plea to sit down and, and speak to him about this. Uh, it looks as though if uh, Secretary Vilsack had moved more swiftly to get the payments out to uh, uh, Blacks, and other farmers of color, the actual debt relief itself, uh, you know, we wouldn't be in this predicament right now. 
So here we have the banks that came out against uh, this measure that didn't want to work with our black farmers by somehow saying, if we got these monies, it would be hurtful uh, to banks. And now you have white farmers who are saying we're causing them harm in some sort of way if we get debt relief at the United States Department of Agriculture. And all reality has been white farmers who have been getting the debt relief the whole time, that they've gotten a half trillion dollars, white farmers, and the U.S. Farm Subsidy Pro Program. Almost all of the direct loans and, 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 and uh, rural development loans and all of these loans at USDA have went to large-scale white farmers in this country. So my question to them is, well, how many times are you going to get? And uh, they don't want to talk about that. So how can we have racial healing in this country if first white farmers don't want to admit that we've been discriminated against by the United States Department of Agriculture? We need to sit down and, and have a real discussion in this country because people, we're living in two Americas. One in, in rural America where you have uh, uh, the, the rebel side and all of these are flags that are, sit higher than the United States flag and they represent, look like to me, white farmers. And then you have black farmers like myself who just want to be treated with dignity and respect and walk into the local county office and be able to attain these uh, our services here in this country. And people, that has not been happening in a fair and equitable manner. And all of the numbers support that statement. John Boyd Jr., thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate your time. So maybe through the auspice of agriculture, farming, you know, this antiquated view that many of us in the melanated community have of agriculture, uh, let's put it in a sports context. Okay, so, you know, I'm not big on gambling, but I understand, okay, you have a winning team and you have a losing team. So there's a Super Bowl, big game, two of the best teams, two of the best uh, competitors within this game end up at this grand game of either somebody's going to win and somebody's going to lose. And so, you know, it's, it's fair for any individual to place their bets on one end. As melanated family, I would say bet on Team Black when it comes to agriculture, right, as far as being able to get out on the field and play and produce. Well, you get to the Super Bowl and, you know, the other team wins, the green team wins, right? Ah, I bet it on Black, my team lost. But then two weeks later, the commissioner comes out and tells you, yeah, uh, well, we found out that the green team cheated. The green team had a camera on the uh, the black team side and they found out all the plays. And so they were able to stop, you know, every play that they were going to run before they ran it. As somebody who lost money placing a bet, you'd be pretty pissed off about that. You'd be like, now, hold up, commissioner. You just found out that the team that, you know, got the championship trophy cheated. Now, what are we going to do about it? And so the commissioner comes back and says, well, yeah, they did cheat. Uh, everybody who won money based on, you know, the green team winning, even though they cheated, well, you can keep your money and, and it's illegal for you as a loser to say something that would be discriminatory. We should have the winners and losers being able to benefit from the green team winning, even if they cheated. I hope that makes sense to the family. And that's, you know, one of the most simple ways I can put what's going on right now with what we call black farmers, melanated farmers in North America. Uh, it would be one thing if, uh, you know, like with the reparations conversation, it's a con it's a constant thing. Well, we need to research this. Uh, we need to do the math. I've heard up to 17 trillion, 23 trillion. OK, but when we're talking about farmers, I mean, we know there's one point nine billion uh, acres of land of that. Back in the 1920s, black farmers have 15 million of that. We're down to less than a couple hundred thousand acres of land. This is for a whole group of people. Uh out of the 3.5 million farmers in North America, only 1.4% between 30, 40,000 are melanated farmers. Uh, the bill that he was talking about, the uh, Farmers of Color Act, that was only going to give debt relief, not money, but debt relief for a few thousand farmers when you put it on the total spectrum of who qualified for it. So once again, if you can't understand the frustration, even if you don't understand agriculture, you understand there's a food production process. Food doesn't just pop up on shelves. It doesn't just pop up through a drive through Somebody has to grow all of the products that we consume, whether it's the meat, whether it's the uh, fruits and vegetables. Somebody has to consume it. Uh, economic entrepreneurial minded people understand, wow, you know, there's a population of 390 million people just here in North America. And one thing that all of them have in common is they have to eat. 
Uh, the majority is going to eat at least two, three times a day on these Super Bowl, on these special days, they're going to eat more. So you can imagine that there's a huge bag for anybody that can supply these meals. How are these meals supplied? It's supplied through production of food. Well, what is the production of food? Agriculture, not just food, but fiber and fuel as well. And so when you represent a group that at one time I was pro I was providing 15 percent of this, uh, not only did my ancestors do this for free for X amount of years because, you know, bad business dealings. But, you know, even after the so-called slavery concept was over, you know, we were still 15 percent of the producers. This was in the 1920s. So now we find ourselves in 2021 with this same group, this team that got beaten and there was proof that the team that won was cheating, the same group, same group can't get any help. And so when we talk about this concept of kicking the can down the road, it wouldn't be as frustrating if you didn't, the commissioner didn't come to me and tell me, oh yeah, uh, the green team, the winning team cheated. <laughs> I gotta be very particular in saying winning team. This is winning according to a falsified game. Did a team win if you, did, if you, didn't, if you didn't really play the game how the game is supposed to be played? Once again, as consumers, as somebody just watching, okay, I can see how it doesn't, you know, get under your skin. But you imagine the few melanated farmers that's left. Uh, the majority of melanated people in North America, we have family, we have agricultural roots. At least three generations back, we have somebody within our family that was in the food production system. Because there, before there was an Amazon, before there was a Walmart, the basic products that were being traded amongst human beings were food, fiber, and, and things that kept us warm, things that things that gave us a quality of life. And so when you understand our ancestors had a big part of that, when we talk about the Black Wall Streets and the many other black towns that we typically don't hear about, one of the key cornerstones of their success was their ability to produce for themselves. So this is why this presents a problem as we're in the age of really discussing reparations, bringing it as a, a, a public discussion. This is how your government responded to this. Oh, well, you know, yeah, we did y'all wrong. We're actually going to give y'all something. It's like the commissioner saying, okay, everybody that lost money on this game because you betted on the team that got cheated on and lost, I'm going to give y'all some of y'all's money back. And so for a while, and this is what this farm bill was. So for a while, you had X amount of farmers like, cool, cool, or X amount of betters, gamblers like, okay, cool, I'm going to get some of my money back because y'all was wrong. I should have won something or the odds would have been different had this game been played fair. And then to, and you're sitting back waiting. You tell you telling the wife, you're telling your friends, whoever you owe money to because you lost this bet because you was betting on the short bet, right? Okay, yeah, it's coming. It's coming. Yeah, the commissioner said, you know, because they figured out they did the investigation that we uh, the other team cheated, they're going to give some money back. And so now what you're doing is building up more debt to all of the people you owe money to after this commissioner told you, uh, yeah, the commissioner said he's going to give me this money back. So as soon as he give me money back, I'll give it to you. Only for the commissioner or somebody under the commissioner to say, oh, well, you know, that would be discriminatory to, to, to have the winner, you know, only have the losers be able to get this money back. Because, see, then we're going to have to give it to some of the winners who lose money if we give it to the uh, losers. Do you see how confusing this is? And it sounds confusing, but this is the essence of what we're dealing with, family. I know I would like to say to a melanated family, to be one ag family, look, this is this is another uh, example of how white supremacy works in this country. This is another example of how racism works in this country. This is another example of why the reparations talk is so important. Uh, we don't realize a lot of people don't realize that how extensive the reach of racism is like we can we can uh see uh racism and white supremacy when we're talking about social justice issues you know uh a white officer killing an unarmed black uh individual you know we can see that and that gets played uh ad nauseum to us throughout you know the news cycle however uh it also reaches into our food and it's not talked about but it also you know, and, and we and that's why B1A exists because we need to shine a light on this because we don't a lot of people don't realize how discriminatory our food system is. A lot of people don't realize, hey, I'm I'm really when I go to my store and my zip code, I'm not really getting 
the best food available because they're shipping it to this other zip code where non-melanated people live. You know, our farmers are dealing with obstacles that uh, non-melanated farmers have to deal with and it affects us all. And we're talking about reparations and getting, you know, our, our, our justice in this country. It involves agriculture, too. And, and really, it starts with agriculture because this is how wealth is attained through land. You know, this is our general wealth, generational wealth is uh attained and passed on to our people to our to our future to our progeny is through agriculture through land acquisition look at this and so when you say usda you can erase that word and just say governing body right uh as above so below the usda is just an appendage of the governing body it is responsible for overseeing farming ranch and forestry industries uh, regulating food quality, safety, nutrition, labeling, uh, administering social services such as social welfare programs, uh, free lunch and, and SNAP and WIC, right? And so when you look at what's happening on the production side of this relationship, production being the people who are growing the food, and I'm hoping the families understanding what we're trying to say. If you're seeing this type of discrimination for the people who are doing the honorable, righteous task of producing, see, most farmers I know, most farmers I know personally, regardless of color, they don't deal in all of that. They deal in, I'm good at growing this, I have the means, I have the know-how, I have the skill set to grow this, and I want to find somewhere to sell it. And so if you see that this discrimination exists on the production layer, and, and the thing is, U.S., the government benefits from just a productive community. Right. Uh, just recently, Biden, uh, they passed a uh, they passed a bill for about 500 million for meat and poultry processing. The goal is, hey, we want to make people more competitive. We want to build back better. Google the concept to build back better. So we want to make them competitive by making this money available for the uh, meat processors. And that's cool. That's cool. As somebody that understands agriculture, it's like, hey, that you know, that's a win. But as a melanated person, it's like, oh, no, now how many melanated farmers, black farmers are going to benefit from this 500 million? Because we saw with the uh, COVID relief, uh, like 98 percent of it didn't go to melanated farmers. It went to everybody else. But how does this, you know, so maybe you're not into maybe you're not into uh, farming, but, you know, somebody or you work through a program that's responsible for divvying out food that is produced by a farmer, the quality of food. Do you think you're going to get an equitable quality of food when you're dealing with something that would deal with the people who are producing in this manner? Right now we're asking questions. What does Nilly, Elder Nilly Fuller say? You get answers by asking questions. Is the way that your food quality, you know, determined if the same agency who's handing out or, or saying that they're passing these loans, giving this debt relief, uh, giving this help. If the same agency is bungling, I'm going to say bungling. I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe they're just bungling it because we've been just used to helping only the white farmers for so long. We don't know how to help the black farmers. I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt, right? But even if you don't know how to benefit the black farmers, do you continuously make it rain on everybody else while you're trying to figure out how to help this group that actually built the wealth of this nation? We got to ask some questions. Do you trust this faction when it comes to SNAP? the food that you're allowed to get with uh, SNAP benefits? Do you trust the, you know, the, the food quality inspection when it comes to the food that you find in your zip code? If you can't, if there's not a basic respect for those who are producing. I know my personal frustration comes in because I see the pattern. It's not like they're running different plays, y'all. They keep running the same play. That's why we call this kick the can. You know, they came out with this uh, farmers, you know, this, uh, farmers of color bill. Great. I'm talking about so many uh, stories, positive, glowing stories. Yes, reparative justice. And then, yeah, we, we, we're going to give this, this debt relief to these farmers because they faced discrimination. We know this. We're admitting this. Yeah, we're going to pass this for our car, for our farmers of color. Then they include other people who did not face the same discrimination that these farmers of color did and was the whole reason for the bill. OK, 
Then you have a group of farmers in Wisconsin who say, hold up, that's discriminatory for giving them debt relief based on color. They're getting this, they were getting this debt relief because they were shorted. This was supposed to be reparative. Then you get the banks that come out and say that, no, that's, we're not going to work with that. We're, you know, the, we get pushed back from the bank saying that we're not going to give these black farmers uh, any more credit. And matter of fact, relieving their debt, you're shorting us. And now we, it's like, that's why I say kick the can. It's like they say they're going to do something. And before they do it, they just kick the can to somebody else. So Kirsten Gillibrand, she's out of New York. This is a senator out of New York. And so she introduced a bill, uh, one-time loan forgiveness of up to 250000 for all small farmers. Uh, you know, she introduced this shortly after the, the, minor, the uh, bill for minority and black farmers was introduced. Her concept was, well, you know, we're helping this group, but we're, we're you know, we don't want to leave out anybody. I want people to take what we're saying and apply this to the whole reparations conversation. Uh, Bob Johnson spoke out about this. He was just talking about how, like, people need reparations. He spoke about how this, this same bill that we're talking about, it was aesthetic. It was an aesthetic win. It was, it was cool for headlines. It was cool to kick the can down the road, uh, keep – Keep y'all folks off of the ball for a couple more months while we further screw this, you know, screw this screw of uh of immobility in place. Because family, every day, every day that passes that we're not, you know, you know, lifting our voices, at least it's showing concern about what's going on with these farmers. What do you think is going to happen for those of us that don't own farms or those of us that aren't producing anything? The farmers represent, you know, and it's not saying it in a romanticized way. These are owners. These are landowners. These are business owners. These are producers. And so, you know, when we're talking about reparative justice, what kind of leverage? We're talking tangibles now. Take emotions aside. What kind of leverage does a consumer have if the producers are getting the business like this? Uh, you know, we were talking about the the vax that thing up, and you know all of these other things going on. And it's I'm I'm deviating away, but not. I mean, you think about the last few weeks we've been talking about how the the music awards and all of these things. Uh, I think the brother Michael B. Jordan tried to start a a, a rum company, and oh, you know, appropriate. We have all of these menial things, and when I say menial, it's not to you know denigrate somebody's stance or. Belief more so than looking at the bigger picture of what's going on around us. If somebody is watching and somebody is like, man, these black folks, <laughs> I mean, some of them are woke, but the, the amount of them that just can be confused just by me moving my finger in, 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 in ratio compared to those that are woke, hey, I'm going to just keep playing to those that will keep this confusion going. So saying that to say with this, this farm bill and what these judges, not just Florida, but what I think the other one was Missouri, and it was brought up from some people out of Wisconsin. What they're learning by watching is that all you got to do is just keep distracting them, give them a headline or two, give us three months. Headline or two, give us three months. And this is becoming predictable. Uh, the elder John Boyd, I, I don't know how many mm -hmm. interviews of his that I've watched now. And this, uh, I've never been fortunate to meet him personally. I would assume, you know, that my path at some point will cross his. But I can only imagine, I can't imagine what he's dealing with. And he, he's being, he's trying to be very calm about it. He's trying to be, you know, diplomatic about it. But you can only imagine the commissioner say, yeah, I'm going to pay y'all back because y'all lost millions of dollars betting on this team. And you found out later that they were cheated on. How are you going to feel about that? Especially when real land is being lost, real monies and, and family legacies are being lost. Food is being lost at the end of the day, because this is what always tripped me out about racism and things like that. It's like racism is so stupid that because when you stop, when you intentionally try to stop a group of people, who are really a part of you. You are essentially uh, throwing uh, throwing monkey, you're, you're throwing monkey wrenches into the machine. 
Because the less productive you try to make them or this group of people or that group of people, you hurt the whole. The more productive everyone is in this country is better for the country. But they're so blinded in this racism and white supremacy that they'd rather they'd rather take the dog on catalytic converter out of their own car. They'd rather flatten their own tires than to see <laughs> to see those tires get some to see those tires get some uh to get a little little shine to them. They'd rather they'd rather pour sugar in the tank than to see that car you know get further down the road. And this car, I mean America. You got you got to do a time analysis, a time and energy exerted analysis. Now, over the last, what does just say, four four decades, forty years, how much energy has been exerted on behalf of the black producers, and you know people within the agricultural sector, you know the different cooperatives, how much time and effort has been pent, been put in trust, been put into the government to fix this issue, you know how many conversations and trust has been broken. You know, asking somebody, hey, this is my grievance. This is these are some things that can be done. And somebody will come to you and say, yeah, I'm going to do it for you and then not do it. How much time was wasted? Uh, how much money for, for lobbying, you know, uh, promote? I don't think we spend nearly enough promotion of just telling people about the uh, plight of black farmers. Because once again, a lot of times if I'm in the city, what's that got to do with me? It's got everything to do with anybody that's an entrepreneur. It's got everything to do with anybody that that, that wants you know, more than just the job. The, the agriculturalist, and I can't repeat this enough, is the original producer. It's the original trapper. It's the original hustler. Before there was a such thing as, as, as content to create online, before there was a such thing as even sports, before there was a such thing as anything that we're able to make money off of, somebody mastered the ability to produce food and distribute it. And so when we're seeing that, and this is why I say farmers are our strongest group of, uh, one of the strongest groups of individuals within our collective community. When we can watch this happen, because we're watching it, you know, whether we scroll through it real fast or not, we're seeing these signs. And, you know, I wonder how many of us are, you know, just going back on our own personal time. Oh, I remember they were going to pass that bill for $4 billion in black farmers. I wonder if they got it. I wonder how many people are going to look into it and realize, oh, it wasn't just for black farmers. I'm, I'm sitting here talking about I want reparations for me, cut the check. But if I'm going to let this trick back go over on the black farmers for this minority of farmers of color, that's going to end up going to every other group, refugees, uh, 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 Native Island, Pacific Islanders, uh, Hispanics. Uh, and it's not being disparaging of, an, of another group. This is being conscientious of your own group. And when we become so, what, what's the antipathetic of what's going on with you know the broader whole of us whether you see them day to day or not that's still a part of our community and when we're able to kind of look over or glaze over or not be conscientious of what's going on on that realm it's inevitably going to manifest on the local realm where we sit okay maybe we're just consumers but if i'm like if i've locked this group of farmers out guess what in 2030 y'all have no choice y'all will have to eat this lab grown meat or just go hungry if i don't want to give it to you no, I'm not going to give you no business loans. No, I'm not going to put any extra effort in, in checking the quality of your food. What leverage do you have? What choice do you have? Y'all didn't support your own when they existed. Y'all sat and watched uh, elders like Mr. Boyd, like Shirley Sherrod, Nuri Rashid. Y'all sat and watched them begging and pleading, hey, how do we, we need some help out here. We need to make it rain. I mean, we can do the work, but hey, the, the faction that y'all are paying us taxpayer dollars to that's supposed to help us do this aren't doing this. And so it's only a certain amount of time that's going to go past before, okay, the responsibility lies in our hands. It's not to say everybody just got money to, to send and donate to, a, you know, adopt the farm programs. But, you know, everything starts with a seed. We have to plant the seed of concern. Uh, when we talk about our social justice, once again, if they if you can't feed yourself, nothing we talk about matters. And it's, it's frustrating on my end. Day to day, I'm watching this. And, and, and last thing I'm going to say, okay, I saw that there was $1 billion allocated for scholarships. I was fortunate to be a recipient of an ag, food, and environment bachelor's degree, but I was an older dude. I was 30-some years old. 
you know, because I had spent the majority of my life, you know, pursuing entertainment and all of these other things. And the majority of students I were around didn't look like me. The ones that did look like me were from other parts of the diaspora. They weren't from here in North America. What I can say is on average, and this is 2019, there were about 39,000 college degrees awarded in agriculture, 39,000. Of that 39,000 ag degrees awarded in agriculture in 2019, a little over 1,100, and this is national, a little over 1,100 went to melanated. When I say melanated, this is including the whole diaspora. And so, like I said, just all I can talk about is my lived experience. The majority of those of melanated persuasion who got these degrees weren't from here. And so, you know, we keep hearing this concept, oh, build back better, make America great. And this isn't disparaging any other group. Uh, what I can say about a lot of my classmates, they, they come from struggle situations. They have every right in the world to, you know, go somewhere where their odds can, can be a little better. But what I'm speaking to is, what well, I guess you won't call it the FBA family, the ADOS family. I don't know. <laughs> but the melanated browns here on this land, if, if total is 1,100, I will guarantee it's only a few hundred of melanated folks who's getting degrees in this field. And it's not to say that the only way to be functional in agriculture is to get a degree. But once again, OK, this group just said, hey, we're going to give this group 11 billions for scholarships, you know, educational opportunities. If we're not preparing young people, once again, planting this seed that, hey, this is something important. This is something to pursue. Hey, young man, you want to play football? OK, why are you playing football? Why don't you take an, up an agronomy course? Uh, why don't you take up a, a, a botany course to learn how to make turf? You know, learn the sciences behind the soils on this field you play on. You interested in basketball? Hey, man, what if you get popular in basketball and happen to have a couple of million dollars to make it rain? Why don't you learn about agroforestry? Why don't you learn about creating, producing the wood? Incorporate some science. Uh, you know, work with a sister that done gone in that wants to be a nurse, but she's really focused her nursing skills on, okay, I don't want all these men breaking their legs. Since we see that we got all these people want to play sports on this specific type of wood, I'm going I'm to work with my homeboy who's on the team but got a scholarship because he's also working on agroforestry. And we're going to come up with a, a ankle break resistant uh, wood floor since we know so many of our people play on it. And I'm being funny, but not. You know, once again, I think Charles Barkley, of all people in the world, made a point. The people who are contracting doing the floors for all of the basketball courts in North America, whether you're talking about youth league, whether you're talking about high school, middle school, professional college, they're getting to a bag. The wood doesn't just come out of nowhere. Somebody has to grow it. And I bet they're not getting concussions. I bet they're not going crazy dealing with fans spitting on them and <laughs> – it starts with the seed family and, uh, you know, stories like this, I could go on forever about this, but stories like this only remind us that, hey, we don't have a lot of friends out here and even even friends, you know, dealing with the problem. So agriculture right now being very specific, there's a resource depletion. Uh, we we keep talking about the droughts, uh, the soil being, you know, degraded, uh, land management and degrading and undervaluing farmland. And so we see that the tech people built, I think Bezos just jumped up as the richest man in the world, 2,200. And this is a point to think about also. There's one man on this world, Jeff Bezos, and I'm not pocket watching, has $211 billion. Do you realize like Bezos by himself has more money than all black businesses in North America combined? We, we, we throw that word king around. We throw that word, uh, I'm a boss around. Uh, Bezos didn't get that on his own. What did Obama say years ago? You didn't get that on your own. He he got that by working with your people like uh, Bill Gates, which are Warren Buffett's. And I'm not upholding these people a special more so than even the richest people understand that there's a network that they got to operate within. Uh, my question is, can us as a melanated family, when we see all of these things, you know, kind of starting to line up, what are the conversations we need to have, family? Who are the people around us that we reach out to? You know, uh, media personalities are cool, but how do we apply some of this knowledge where we're at? People we know. Do we know people that are good at growing? They might not be the best business people in the world. They might not be the most sociable. But they know how to grow. Are we mixing them with the hood stars? Are we getting the hood stars like, hey, bro, I want, hey, sis, I want you to have a personal one-on-one -on -one tour of this growing facility. 
If you understand moving work, moving weight, hey, I got weight of carrots. I got weight of these fresh greens. Let, let me let me pick your brain a little bit, youngin, so I can figure out how to get these greens to the people, your grandmother, your mother, your father, your uncle, the people you care about. We got to have some non-conventional conversations because this is a silent war. And I'll say that. This is a silent war waged against black farmers. And if black farmers are the only ones defending themselves having this conversation, it doesn't look good. And one thing we can definitely do for ourselves in this fight, in this silent war, is definitely grow your own food. Get that ancient knowledge of how to grow your own food. Let's get black to the garden. Sign up at healthyblackfood.com and learn how to grow your own food. This is a, this is a very uh, insightful, engaging, culturally relevant course. And you will learn how to grow your own food. We're planting these seeds uh, now uh, for the future. Uh, these growing your own food and gardening for yourself. Uh, it helps to bridge generational gaps. You know, it helps to build those generational gaps because at the end of the day, for us to to really see justice, for us to really see progress, we're going to have to work together. And that's across the world. We're all going to have to work together, but we need to start with ourselves. You know, we need to start with our own families first. You know, it's a lot easier to work with everyone else when you know how to work uh, with work with yourself first. See what I'm saying? So go to healthyblackfood.com. Learn how to grow your own food. Also, make sure that you subscribe to B1 Ag, the Daily Bread podcast on YouTube. Just type B1 Ag, Daily Bread podcast in the search bar. Subscribe. We need to keep this conversation going. We need to keep this, com we need to keep this conversation growing. We need this conversation uh, every day to talk about our food and what it means to us because it is it does mean everything to us everything okay farmer brown you know they like they like you know it's like it, <laughs> i know uh when i was young and you know you had the, that game keep away you know you might you might have a like you know we, i'm from a country boy so you know i'm out here in georgia south georgia you know there's a lot of pine cones so we might have to play keep away with a pine cone you know person has a pine cone somebody's trying to get that pine cone and you just toss it to other people while one person just keeps running back and forth like a crazed lunatic trying to get this this pine cone or whatever keep away and that's exactly the game that they're playing with this debt relief and also reparative justice for our black farmers in the same game that they're playing with our black farmers they're playing this with us our melanated peoples in this country when it comes to reparative justice in this country for what is rightfully owed for, for, for what was unjustly taken from our ancestors. Perception is everything. If you perceive, oh, I'm just so glad to be here and thank you, Master, for letting me breathe, that's one thing. But if you realize, like, man, this was mine, and you took it. And okay, and you took it not because you just beat us up, but we were being cool. We were being nice. We were opening up the doors of what the Most High blessed us with, right? And so if you understand it as you have every right to this land as any anybody else that occupies this land, you have a very different context in why supporting black farmers. Like I said, if, if I'm in the middle of a hood somewhere, okay, realistically speaking, no, I'm not about to hop on a tractor and start farming. If I ain't even around no green space, because we know there are cities around uh, North America, there isn't no green space. There's so many other fields within agriculture. Uh, I think one of my biggest frustrations, uh, you know, I hate to come from a negative standpoint, is people, we, we really, not all of us, but not enough of us understand the, the, the gravity of how agriculture and production affects all of us, no matter where we are. Uh, anybody that has a skill set, where are you an artist? Are you a people person? Are you good with numbers? Are you good with technology? Are you good at cooking? Are you good at creating uh, products, health products? Are you big into uh, you know healthy natural products? You know lavender, herbs. All of these go into agriculture. We need industries 
uh, to keep it simple, stupid, we need industries that can make it rain on multiple entities per product. Uh, one of my homeboys got a sweet potato pie. He came out of nowhere. I doubt my, my bro Hashim has, has stepped a, a day on a farm, but he understood coming from Jersey like, hey, I got grandma's sweet potato uh, pie uh, recipe. I got access to a commissary kitchen. I know where to get some pie shells bulk. Um, I holla at my boy. You know, Farmer Brown did his label for him. I have a popping product now. I'm going to test it at, uh, you know, local vendors. And now people request this product. And I watched this process happen over about four months. This is somebody not on a farm, just in the city, realize, okay, there's something. There's something I know how to produce. Uh, there's people that will eat it. I'm going to need a container for it. I'm going to have to go through the proper uh, process of making sure it's healthy and people aren't getting sick from my product. I'm going to get up with the hustlers, the people who sell things anyway. I'll give you a percentage of the sales of this sweet potato pie. Uh, bro, you come up with this design and marketing strategy for me. I give you a percent and we are all going to eat of this pie. And the more of these pies we can sell, the bigger our slice is. And we can apply this to everything that we consume as a family, everything. Everything that goes in our body and on our body, somebody is producing. So be one act family. Let's get to producing. Let's get to growing. Let's get to let's get black to the garden. Let's get black to the essence. Let's embrace this God given right that we all have. And that's to grow something. Farmer Brown talked about a lot today. We hope that our uh, audience really learned something. Put, hopefully we planted some seeds that will continue to grow uh, so that they can come up with, uh, uh, help come up with some of these solutions that will help, you know, our community, the melanated peoples and the world, you know, I, I really believe that there are a, a myriad of social economic issues that can be handled. That's a myriad of social economic issues that can be solved straight through agriculture. So Farmer Brown, if the people really, really want to know something, what's the best, what do they need to do? What's the best way that they can really know something, Farmer Brown? If you really want to know something, Think production over consumption and learn how to grow something. There it is. We'd like to thank you for coming and just uh, chilling with us. You know, listen to another episode of Daily Bread Podcast. This is very important. We hope that you feel nourished. We hope you feel loved. It's a new week. Let's uh, make sure that you uh, get a new reach uh, this week. You know, let's get further than we were uh by the end of the week than we were today. Grow on, love on, let abundance and prosperity chase you and it will catch you. Thank you, we'll see you soon. The John Henry Harris, Farmer Brown EMC, it's the B1 Ag Daily Bread Podcast. See you later.